Hello. Hello. I uh, think we can start. We seem to be having all the presenters. Uh, I want to welcome you to this uh, webinar, which will take approximately one and a half hours. We are members of Water Journalists Africa. This webinar is organized by Water Journalists Africa through its project called For Nile. We, uh, we started, Water Journalists Africa started about uh, 2011, and uh, after six years, we started a project called InfoNile. Water Journalists Africa is a network of about 700 journalists in Africa that report specifically on water. So we've been uh, reporting on water for all those years across Africa. There are 50 countries that are members of this network. But in 2017, we started uh, another project called uh, InfoNile. InfoNile is a geojournalism project. Uh, this focuses on River Nile. And we've been writing about the story of the Nile uh, for all these years. Uh, we practice geojournalism. We tell stories of the Nile using location data generated by scientists. Uh, I want to introduce uh, Anika, who is the CEO of InfoNile, to uh, go ahead and ask about this webinar and the, uh, what it is all about. Then later we'll go to uh, our funders, uh, this webinar and uh, the project under which this webinar comes to you is funded by uh, uh, Internews, Earth Journalism Network. Uh, we are so glad they were able to give us funds to carry out these activities. I would like to invite Anika to tell us about this uh, webinar in detail, so what it's all about. Uh, I didn't introduce myself. My name is Frederick Mujira, just the CEO of Water Journalists Africa. Thank you, Fred, um, and thank you everyone for joining the webinar today. Just to tell you a little bit about InfoNile, we are a geojournalism platform reporting on water, environment, and climate change in the 11 countries in the Nile River Basin. And we work with a network of about 500 environmental journalists focusing on covering underreported stories in the Nile region. As an organization, we provide small story grants, we do data journalism trainings, and we work on geojournalism collaborative investigations. Um, so if you're interested to join our network, please go to infonile.org and fill up the sign up form. We're really excited to be holding this webinar today on a topic that we believe is so critical to the health of our whole planet, especially in this time of COVID-19. Um, if you'd like to contribute to the conversation online, please tag us at infonile and use the hashtag media for wildlife. We won't have time for everyone to introduce themselves individually, but please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat box um, and get to know other people. We wanted to mention that this webinar is actually part of a month long series of trainings for a group of East African journalists who will be supported to report stories on wildlife trafficking. This program is supported by the Earth Journalism Network as Fred mentioned. So at this point, I'd like to welcome Joffrey Kamadi, who is an award-winning environmental journalist and our InfoNile Kenya coordinator. And he'll be the moderator for today's webinar. Thank you so much, Anika. I hope everybody can hear me. Can uh, everybody hear me? I can hear you. Okay, so, so I will introduce uh, the topic of the day today, which is uh, preventing another pandemic, redefining our societies to live sustainably with our species and what the media can do about it. I will now introduce this short five minute video featuring Jen Goodall, a world renowned primatologist and anthropologist talking about the relationship between wildlife and the pandemic. Welcome. Rainforests and campaigning to give people alternatives to killing and trafficking animals. But now, in the midst of yet another global pandemic, which some say has been caused by human interference with wild animals, 
Jane Goodall says there is only one species which has caused this, us. Our chief correspondent, Alex Thompson, has been speaking to her, and just to warn you, this report does contain some distressing images. Um, we've done this to ourselves in a way because this pandemic or similar has been predicted for years and years and years. We've been destroying the animals' habitats, which means the animals themselves are crowded together. But it also means some of those animals are, are forced to move out and be in greater contact with humans. That's how these pandemics uh, start. But in addition, we're hunting animals, we're killing them, we're eating them, and we're trafficking them. We're putting animals from all different countries along with their viruses, which don't affect them, uh, putting them together, the viruses happily jump from one to the other, and one of those is going to jump to a human in one of the wildlife markets in Africa or, um, or Asia, or from our, our farms. Those, that's another great breeding place for new disease. Should we have a worldwide ban on this in this entire trade, both in terms of trafficking and the markets? Well, obviously we should, because you know many epidemics before this have started in the same way. And you know, it's people are calling it the China virus. We started HIV in Africa from eating uh, chimpanzees who have the SIV virus, which jumped in and made this new you know, HIV-1 and then again HIV-2. And another one started with camels. And then I know you say it's another subject, but one started from mm. pigs, another from horses, and uh, another from chicken. But we need cheap food, so how do we get around that? Well, first of all, I think it's time we began realizing it's because we have disrespected animals and disrespected the environment. And people seem to think, oh, we humans with our, you know, brilliant intellects, we don't need nature, but actually we do. We need the natural world for clean air, for clean water. Uh, we need clean, uncontaminated soil to grow our food. We, we're actually part of the natural world. The more we destroy it in all these different ways. And of course, this ties directly to the climate crisis as well. So it's all people tend to forget because of the panic over, um, you know, COVID-19. But it's, it, it's our disrespect that's caused both. And yes, we need to close down the meat markets permanently and trading in wild animals for anything. When we give nature a little bit of a helping hand, rewilding projects and so forth, enormous things can happen and very quickly. And they do. And, you know, that's one of my reasons for hope. I go around talking about hope because if we lose hope, that's the end. Because if you don't have hope, well, why bother? And there must be millions of people who want to keep this status quo that's happened because of the lockdown. Breathing clean air in Mumbai and in Beijing, looking up and seeing the stars twinkling in the night sky. For some of them, that's completely a new experience. Nobody's going to want to go back to the, to the pollution and the ugliness that we create. You know, but I also hope that this wakes people up to a better understanding of who animals are and stop thinking them as commodities. They weren't put here for us to exploit and abuse. They were part of a wonderful, vibrant world and we come along and do our best to destroy it. So the biggest difference between us, chimpanzees and other animals is the development of this extraordinary intellect. So isn't it bizarre that this most intellectual creature is destroying its only home? Oh, okay. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Gladys Kalema Zikusoka, who is our keynote speaker this morning, this afternoon, or this evening, depending on where you might be. Dr. Gladys Kalema Zikusoka is founder and CEO of an award-winning NGO and nonprofit founded in 2003 called Conservation Through Public Health, CTPH, that primarily works with endangered gorillas. Her conservation journey began in 1988 when she revived Kibuli Secondary School Wildlife Club in her 
high school in Uganda. This led her to what? This led her to want to become a veterinarian who also works with wildlife. After graduating from the Royal Veterinary College, University of London, in 1996, she established Uganda Wildlife Authority, UWS, first veterinary department. In 2000, she did a zoological medicine residency and master in specialized veterinary medicine at North Carolina Zoological Park and North Carolina State University, where master's research on disease issues at human, wildlife, livestock interface led her to found conservation through public health in 2003. In 2015, she founded Gorilla Conservation Coffee support farmers living around habitats where gorillas are found. The most recent award for CTPH is the 2020 St. Andrews Prize for the Environment. Dr. Gladix is a National Geographic Explorer and Ashoka Fellow and Mulago Foundation Henry Arnold Fellow and has been featured on CNN African Voices, Chinese Global Television Network Faces of Africa, and recently on the National Geographic Women of Impact documentary. She has won the 2008 San Diego Zoo Conservation in Action Award, 2009 Weekly Gold Award, 2011 Wings Women of uh, Discovery and Ex Exploration Humanity Award, 2017 President of Uganda, Golden Jubilee Award for her contribution to the nation as a conservationist and veterinarian on Women's Day, 2008 Sierra Club Earth Care Award, 2019 finalist for the Task Award for Conservation in Africa, and the 2020 Uganda Veterinary Association World Veterinary Day Award. She is on the Leadership Council of Women for the Environment in Africa. Dr. Kal Dr. Kalema Zikusoka will make her 20 minute presentation. Over to you, Dr. Kalema Zikusoka. Thank you very much for inviting me to this exciting panel. It's very good to see, um, to be on a panel with the media because we really rely on the media to, to promote our messages. So I'm going to give a PowerPoint presentation and I'm about to share my screen. Uh, and thank you for the great introduction about my work. Uh, I did start my conservation journey when I was 18 years old and by setting up the wildlife clubs. And I think it's one of the most impactful local NGOs in Africa because I did find that when working as a first vet for the Uganda Wildlife Authority, my immediate boss, Captain Otikat, was also started a wildlife club in the university. And Professor Erike Droma actually founded the Wildlife Clubs of Uganda with uh, Honorable Ken Luchamuzi in the 1970s. So we started conservation through public health in 2003 because we were concerned about disease transmission between people and wildlife. Um, we had a scabies outbreak in the gorillas, which is traced to people living around the park who have very little health care. And so when COVID-19 happened, I got very concerned because it's another zoonotic disease and was affecting people and it came from animals. I know there are a lot of debates about where did COVID-19 come from and a number of conspiracy theories. Um, however, the most likely, especially us who work with animals, who work in wildlife conservation, who work in public health, is an animal source. As Dr. Jane Goodall said in her video that we've just been seeing, the states in the Wuhan West market where it is believed to have started, it's terrible. You have wild animals which are captured from the wild. You know, they could be pangolins, civets. They're put in very small cages and they're not used to being in small cages. So they start to get stressed. And when you're in a small cage next to other animals which are not with the 
same species as you, it's even more stressful and you start to shed virus. And people say that that wet market is very, 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 very scary. Some people don't, some conservationists don't go there just for health reasons, because you have so many people, animals that stuck together, so many people, it's very, very crowded. So it's a perfect condition for a virus like COVID, for like SARS-CoV-2, which created COVID-19, to spread from one host to another. Um, there has been other bats-related coronaviruses implicated in previous pandemics like SARS, you know, severe immune respiratory syndrome, which came from a civet cat, the intermediate host, and MERS, Middle East respiratory syndrome, which also came from, started with bats, but the intermediate host was a camel. People are pointing to the pangolin being an intermediate host, but it hasn't yet been proven. And this virus is very scary because it's an RNA virus, which means it can easily mutate, easily settle anywhere. It doesn't need a lot to enter into the cells of the body and it can easily transfer from species to species and mutate. So that's why it easily jumped from animals to people, spreading very quickly between people with air travel, um, close contact, it's now all over the world. And it, it can also easily jump to other animals. So, and also we found that it's not only through droplets, but fecal contamination. So people who have recovered can still be infectious in that way. I've been working with uh, mountain gorillas for over, you know, starting as a vet student in 1994 when I went to do research and then setting up the first veterinary department of Uganda Wildlife Authority and where I was actually hired because they were concerned that the gorillas had just been habituated for tourism and they were worried that a tourist may bring some a fatal flu, just like COVID-19. And so they felt that they needed to have a vet to make sure that the gorillas are healthy and people don't make them sick. And so, but actually shortly after I was hired, I did find that it was not only the tourists that were making gorillas sick, but also the local community. This is my, one of my favorite gorillas, Kanyoni, who unfortunately died at the end of 2017 when he was only 21 years old, which for a gorilla is actually quite young. Gorillas can live up to 50 years. He's, fortunately, he died of just, you know, things that happened in the forest, fighting with another gorilla, falling off a tree and then fighting with another gorilla. It wasn't a human-related disease. But many people were so sad when he died and it showed how far conservation has gone in Bwindi, where the local community really appreciates the gorillas because they're... So mountain gorillas in Uganda and gorillas all over Africa are all threatened by habitat loss. There's a very high human population growth everywhere and there's a very hard edge between the forest and the park, which means that the gorillas can easily come out and people can also go into the forest. And in Uganda, we don't have poaching of gorillas, but in other countries they do, where people can still eat gorilla meat, Central Africa and West Africa. But however, there's poaching for other animals in the forest, like daika and bush pig, which also affect gorillas because they get caught in snares and also people get close to them. And people shouldn't be poaching these animals because they're also threatened. So we had a skin disease outbreak in the gorillas, cabies, which came from people living around the park who have very little health care. The gorillas got it not by people coming to see them, but by them going to see people. They went to people's gardens to eat their banana plants. And in the process, they found dirty clothing on a scarecrow and the disease spread through the group. And eventually we found that it came from people's dirty clothing and they easily got scabies caused by a parasite, a cryptic mange. Uh, they easily got it because they're closely related to us and they were naive hosts and it actually resulted in a baby gorilla dying and the rest only recovered with treatment. So these little boys over here would be in school, but they were herding goats. And when you have so much poverty, it's very difficult to make sure that the gorillas remain healthy when the people are also not healthy. So we found out that we needed now to start addressing community health as well as gorilla health. This is something that occurs quite commonly because of the very hard edge between the community and the park. There isn't much of a buffer zone and it's only in the southern sector of the park. The gorillas eat people's banana plants and people are not very happy. But it's also a perfect condition for diseases to spread between people and wildlife. Over here, for those who have been lucky to go to Buindi to track, um, these tourists are visiting 
uh, viewing gorillas in Guindi, and they're following the seven meter rule. Um, one thing that a lot of people have asked me is a human, a great apes susceptible to COVID-19? Yes, they are. Um, just as we picked it up from animals, we can give it to animals. And, you know, and especially in areas where there's a lot of, you know, wildlife trafficking, this becomes a big issue. So there's been human metanema virus in animals in Rwanda, gorillas in Rwanda. They got it from human beings. Uh, there's been a human rhinovirus, chimps in Kibale National Park, um, came from people. And there's also been another outbreak of coronavirus from chimpanzees, people to chimpanzees in Ivory Coast. And COVID-19, as we have heard, has also gone to animals in zoos, which are not even closely related to us, like tigers, and it's also affecting cats and dogs. Um, and two studies have shown that great apes and old world primates, like baboons, chimps, all have similar ACE2 protein receptors that make them highly susceptible to SARS-CoV-2. So we can easily make our closest cousins sick. We carried out some training with the Uganda Wildlife Authority um, who invited us to do some training on how to prevent the spread of COVID-19 between people and gorillas when the outbreak began and when we started to get cases in Uganda. And actually when you get one case of COVID-19 in Uganda, it's an outbreak because then one case results in very many other cases as has happened all over the world. And we worked with all these partners here, Mountain Gorilla Vet Project, International Gorilla Conservation Program, Max Planck, to do this training in Gwindi. Of course, people are always told that they have to be seven meters away uh, at the briefing before they begin. And this is what seven meters... However, we found when we did Ohio University, Annalisa Weber led the research um, with her supervisor, Dr. Nancy Stevens. We found that 60% of the time, the tourists broke the rules in spite of being briefed by the rangers before they started tracking. And 40% of the time, the gorillas broke the rules because they're so used to us. Like Kanyonyi, who I showed you in the photo, he was habituated when, when he was a baby when his group was habituated. I've known him since he was a baby. And now he's, he was heading the group. He used to like frightening tourists to see their reaction. Such gorillas have totally lost their fear of people and they're very comfortable, which is good, but also bad because they can easily get poached and harmed. So we decided to um, upgrade the existing gorilla viewing rules. And some of them, of course, have to, were just enforced. Like nobody's allowed to visit the gorillas when you have flu or cough. That has always been there from the very beginning when gorilla tourism began in 1996. I'm currently, in that photograph, I'm taking um, the temperature of uh, someone from Bindi Community Hospital, Haven. He came to train the park staff in how to prevent COVID between themselves during this training. And now, because the very first index case in Uganda had a high temperature without a cough or flu, anyone visiting the gorillas has to have their temperatures checked. And the great thing about the non-contact infrared thermometers is you don't have to touch somebody. People don't have to share the thermometer. Um, and they, were, they, were, they became very popular with the Ebola outbreaks that we had, especially bordering Uganda and DRC. And that's how you could stop, you could measure people's temperatures without being infected by highly infectious diseases like Ebola. And of course, like it is all over the country, mandatory hand washing and water and disinfectant before trekking. It's all over when you go to Bwindi, you have to do that. One big thing that we also, that was introduced through this training was wearing of masks. Now everybody has to wear a mask when they visit gorillas. And these, if you notice in the photograph, these are cloth masks. The time when we, were, we held the training, there were no surgical masks remaining in Uganda. Um, conservation through public health is on the National Disease Task Force of the Ministry of Health. And when I asked where we could buy surgical masks, they said they'd run out. But luckily a lady from CDC said, that we could actually, we don't need to have a surgical mask. You can make a cloth mask with lining, which can also reduce the incidence of viruses coming from you to others. So the local entrepreneur, Ride for a Woman, Evelyn and Des, we asked them if they could make cloth masks. They were laying off their staff because they, their staff were making tablecloths for tourists and there were no tourists coming to Windy and they were very depressed. But when we asked her to make cloth masks, she was happy because she could hire them uh, hire some of her staff and keep them busy in this very difficult time. So they've made masks for the park staff. And when we went out to the gorillas, of course, it was raining that day. 
and was very good that we had cloth masks. And now that's the new regulation, really enforcing the seven meter distance, wearing cloth masks. And because now we know that we're hearing that COVID-19 can spread through fecal matter, the rule of digging a hole 30 centimeters deep when you want to go to the toilet and do a number two is very, very, it's going to be enforced. And right now, of course, people are still going in. The park staff have to check on the gorillas, make sure they're healthy, um, and also make sure they're not being harmed. Because now with no tourism, there's likely, there's an increased likelihood of people to go into the forest to poach because they are hungry and they have no, they don't have many other alternatives. So COVID-19 enabled a review of the great eight viewing regulations, both for gorillas and chimpanzees. And as we speak now, both uh, Bwindi and Kibale National Park have infrared thermometers and Budongo is acquiring some. Actually, the one in Kibale was donated by Dr. Jessica Rothman, who's an honorary warden, and she's from Hunter College and does a lot of research there. And CTPH, we donated infrared thermometers to Bwindi and IGCP donated the masks. All the partners have come in to do something in one way or another. And this is something that's really going to help because a lot of tourists are asking the tour operators that we don't want to come back to Gwindi or to Kibale to track gorillas or chimps. We don't want to actually come because we're worried we'll make them sick. And we're telling them that, no, um, you need, you're needed. The tourism is needed because if you don't have tourists coming, people are, are going to, if a gorilla goes in their garden and they kill it because they're no longer benefiting from it, they need the tourism dollars because it's really helping their community. But we are all being careful and they're, they're sharing with them the latest guidelines so that tourism can resume when the pandemic ends. This is very important. And because, as I mentioned, the gorillas also go outside the park to eat people's banana plants. Um, this brochure was actually developed when I was still the vet office at Uganda Wildlife Authority. And because everybody was concerned that the gorillas were getting sick, people are not covering their rubbish heaps, there's open defecation and they get sick from other things, not only scabies. So we developed these and they're still very relevant because we still use them. And then we also trained the human gorilla conflict resolution team, which are people who had gorillas back into the park when they come out. That's the community conservation warden, Barbara Mugisha, training them in talking about how to prevent disease between people and COVID. They all have to wear masks as they had gorillas back. And everybody knows that that's what they need to do. They need to call out the heroes. We developed these posters with support from ACAS Foundation and Solidaridad, we hope to design them. And if you notice on this poster, it's for people, but there's an extra section about gorillas. And on there, the names of the two wardens, Joseph Arinatwe, the research and monitoring warden, and Barbara Mugisha, the community conservation warden. They can call on them if gorillas come into their garden. And the communities understand this because they benefited so much from gorilla tourism and they don't want to make the gorillas sick. Of course, it's also in the local language, which most people understand. And another way that we support the communities is we improve their health. And we've been talking about scabies, HIV, TB, but now, now we are also talking about COVID. COVID is being managed together with TB. So currently, as I speak, my team is in the field talking to the village health teams and getting them to also talk about COVID-19 as they promote family planning and they're reporting homes visited by gorillas. They're on high alert for that. Talking about zoonotic diseases that can spread between people and gorillas. They're checking out for people who may be entering the forest illegally to poach. They're being very serious about that and telling people they shouldn't do it even if they are hungry. There are other ways that we're trying to see how they can be helped. And all of this is very, very important to protect the gorillas and the people in this very difficult time. So my team is out here, Alex is training the village health teams. And as you see, we're using the social distancing guidelines from the president. People are not getting close to each other and we're only training them five at each time. It's more expensive, but it's really important for people to not to infect each other even during the training. And they're taking this message very, very seriously. So I think I, there's something I need to talk about because it's very connected to wildlife trafficking as well. In the absence of tourism, how do we ensure that wildlife is protected? Because when people are hungry, they don't have any income, how are they going to survive? They're more likely to go into the forests, to poach, um, just to survive, actually, and if nothing else. So it's very important to support alternative livelihoods that are not dependent on tourism. And we, it's important to provide commodities like gorilla conservation coffee for customers 
who are not able to travel to Uganda. I already talked about Right for a Woman, who's now making masks for people coming into close contact with gorillas and for those providing health care. This photograph is at Entebbe Duty Free. Prior to COVID, they were our biggest customers for Gorilla Conservation Coffee, actually, which is over here. Um, we created it as an alternative livelihood for people around the park. Those who are not benefiting from tourism could at least have us buy their coffee at a higher price, as long as it's good. And then we can sell it to tourists who come and other people around the world who are interested in supporting coffee with the cause, supporting gorillas and drinking good coffee. And so now we found that even if the market has reduced and we haven't had any orders since March from Interbe Duty Free, because they don't have customers, people abroad are able to order the coffee. And you've seen the fundraising drives for the animals in the wild and in zoos like UEC. And we are now thinking of also providing food for the most vulnerable. In the case of Bwindi, you know, maybe food that can grow quickly so that people can eat. So that's right for a woman. Um, this lady, these ladies are now being re-employed, or at least they have a revenue that can keep them going because instead of making tablecloths for tourists, they're making masks, which is very important. And with Gorilla Conservation Coffee, you know, we're supporting people like this. This lady who's out there, a donation from every bag sold goes to support the work of CTPH to improve community health, gorilla health, and conservation education. Because even, in, even though there's COVID-19 with no tourism, we can transport the coffee to America, to pangos.com, and recently we're now transporting it to the UK. And this lady over here from Manero Beans, Vicky, she received Gorilla Conservation Coffee last week through DHL. And people are able to support gorillas without having to visit them. And this has made people around the world happy because they, everyone is depressed about COVID-19. But if they feel that they can do something about it, you know, save the animals, protect them, stop them being poached, protect the other wildlife in the gorilla's habitat by buying Gorilla Conservation Coffee, they feel that they're doing something about the desperate situation. So we're really pleased that she can do that. And how can the media help? Um, I've been so fortunate that ever since I started my career in conservation, the media, I've had a lot of a media, media attention. I've been animals. When they see a wild animal, they say, that's the next meal for the lion, or it's just old. Even when I did the very first post-mortem in Windy of a gorilla that died of old age, people were like, but it's just old. Mugulus is just old. And you know, when we found that he, after the post-mortem, he had kidney failure and mild heart disease, they're like, oh, okay, so gorillas, you can do post-mortem on them like people. So, and then when we started CTPH, um, people were like, how can you integrate human health and animal health? That's weird. So we've had a lot of media attention, and I really want to thank the media. New Vision, glad that Gerard Tenua is one of the panelists. New Vision has been amazing at promoting our work and influencing the general public. A lot of people in the general public really care about gorillas now because of the media houses like New Vision. And in Kenya, it's, they've done amazing. I mean, Kenyans really love their wildlife. They love their elephants, the rhinos. It's just amazing. So I really want to thank the media for influencing the general public. And also, a lot of decision makers and policy makers read these papers, and it's very important to influence them in that way and help together. And COVID-19, our, our mission and what we do is really has never been more urgent. COVID-19 has shown how urgent it is because we are preventing that spillover from animals to people to animals. And we really want Okay, it looks like uh, Gladys has uh, completed her presentation. So I think uh, there is a, quite a lot to unpack in her presentation. 
uh, no gorilla poaching in Uganda, but in the neighboring countries are experiencing uh, poaching activities, uh, addressing community health and gorilla health, uh, tourists not adhering to the seven meter distance rule and so on and so forth. So I think uh, the participants should be thinking about when we come to the question and the answer session. Uh, at this juncture, I'd like to introduce to you with uh, Caroline Chebet. Caroline Chebet is an investigative wildlife crime reporter attached to, to the Standard Group in Kenya. She is a storyteller. Her work spans from uh, general news to deep investigative features to feature stories on everyday life across East African countries. She has six years experience in the newsroom, having launched her career with the National Media Group as a features writer before moving to Standard Group, where she majorly focuses on conservation stories. She also contributes to the UK's independent newspaper, where she brings a perspective on conservation stories with the national and regional outlook. In addition, she belongs to the Giants Club African Conservation Journalism uh, Fellowship, a consortium that brings together conservation journalists from Kenya, Uganda, Botswana, and Gabon. Uh, in addition, she is a media trainer and capacity builder focused on training journalists to report wildlife crime in the region. Her goal as a conservation reporter is to tell African conservation stories to the world, stories that ignite debates and drive agendas and even inspire formulation of policies. Her goal is also to tell conservation stories that are positively impact and bring change as well as raise awareness and boost understanding of African conservation stories by highlighting the hits and misses in different conservation models. Among the stories she has pursued in the past few years include trafficking of pangolins and cheetah cubs in East Africa, conservation of rhinos, vultures, and migratory birds on UNESCO World Heritage Sites and UNESCO Global Geoparks and Sites Trade Databases. Database. She has also highlighted several stories on wetlands and Ramsar sites and on how pollution is leading to diseases that affect species like frogs and toads, among others. These stories have also ignited debates and have had positive impact with the ISAM leading to formulation of policies. She believes African conservation journalists have the power to tell expert and data-driven stories that will transform conservation sectors. She also believes that with networking, Blockbuster stories that are much underreported can be, I can see the limelight. So it's my pleasure to uh, give the floor to uh, Tibet and uh, make a five minute presentation about uh, what she does. Welcome, Tibet. <laughs> Hi, Chibet. Do you want me to show your presentation? Yes, kindly. Uh, good afternoon. I hope everyone is, is okay where they are. I am, my name is Caroline Chebet. I am a, an environmental and conservation writer with the Standard Group based in Kenya. Nakuru. I write for the Standard newspaper, and I'm also a, a journalism fellow with uh, with African with the Space for Giants. Uh, I'll share my brief presentation on how media how media or journalists can help in conserving wildlife. As media, we have a, we play a very big role in in highlighting the role of 
in conserving wildlife. In some sh sharing briefly on how me how media can can help in conserving wildlife, we have the role to highlight the ills by calling out on the perpetrators. We have the in calling out. Uh, in calling out of the perpetrators, we can also utilize available data from uh, from conservation organizations like CITES, like Traffic Global Initiative Against International Organized Crimes, and other organizations. There are several organizations where we can source data as journalists, and also we can al always highlight and celebrate positive stories and celebrate environmental heroes we have in our midst. That way we, can, we also bring to light how this conservation, how conservation has a positive impact in the environment. We, ha we can also do a lot of, we can present stories that are f factual, back to figures, that are driven and expert driven stories. That way we really have, we really paint the how how the, we we really paint the the extent uh, the extent at which this trafficking poaching and other criminal activities against wildlife conservation are perpetrated we can also through networking we can also bring in experts like you, we were we were talking to Dr. Gladys. How you, you see how, how how an expert can really shed light on conservation of some species, like her, her role in conservation of gorillas. Then we also follow the stories, but let let them have their own life. On how we that is that is giving the story, letting the story to tell to have a life of its own to tell. You see how, how Gladys was telling us a very interesting story on how she has been doing research on, on, on gorillas. Uh, that is on how media journalists can help conserve wildlife. We can move to the next slide. Uh, I will share a brief of some of the stories, I've, some, some of the few stories I've done and it has uh, had some positive impact especially how, what we do at the standard group. We do, we publish stories on wildlife on a, mostly on a daily basis. We have, a, we have conservation col columns to run such stories. We also focusing, we are, we, are, we are also focusing on highlighting the challenges, the hits and misses in conservation. Like, and we, we also highlight the critical challenges in conservation like poaching, on wildlife trafficking, and the efforts also that are in place to to curb these vices. We also we at Standard Group also we we have been investing on stories on wildlife, like for as a wildlife reporter, sometimes you pitch a story to your we we pitch stories to to the news desk, and then they can assign us to go and to the field and report on such stories. And we also celebrate key wildlife days in the calendar by highlighting, by running those stories to, ra to run on that day. Like when we were celebrating on wild, world, wildlife, world Wildlife Day, we write, we look at the global, global image on the, the global celebration and also link it, bring it to the national limelight. At Standard, also we partner with organizations such as Rhino Arc to highlight some of the successful models in conservation. Like recently, we had a story on the the Rhino Arc was pioneering. Uh, they they are called automatic elephant gates to help mitigate the human wildlife conflicts. In that way, we we partner most with these conservation organizations so that they can share their success stories. We can move to the next slide. And then celebrating our own wins, some of the stories that have really had an impact and led to formulation of policies. 
there was a, the, like the, the story we shared in this slide, the launch of rehabilitation programs in Mao. There was a story I followed up in, in 20, in, that was in 2018. There is a, a swamp within Mao Forest that is a source, is a key source of Mara River that supports tourism in the East Africa region. And also, this this swamp also is a lifeline to many lakes in East Africa. So, but there there the swamp had been facing some challenges in conservation, like. There was a there there were no control they were no no longer controlling livestock it was not fenced and there was a lot of destruction and also planting of exot uh, of commercial trees around the swamp which was really drying it up and might have had impact even in the flow of other of rivers across the East Africa through highlighting of that story. Into, for the, in 2018 and 2019, by 2020, the government gazetted the, 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 wet, the, the swamp as a wetland. And there have been also some positive stories I have been highlighting. Like there was, there is a lake in, it is called Lake Kamnarok National Reserve. It's a national reserve that has really had challenges of encroachment. It is a an elephant breeding site, but it has and it is also it hosts one of Africa's second largest home of crocodiles. But the challenge people had, had it has it it was it had people had encroached, and there are also challenges of siltation. And currently, it has inspired the then currently the county. Assembly of Baringo are debating, uh, coming up with the uh, regulations to fence the National Reserve. And in our next slide, I think that is just a brief of what we do in the standard and on some of the stories I have done. I've also been doing stories on, on wildlife trafficking, on poaching, analyzing the site trade database and other stories. Yes. Yes. Wow. Jeffrey, what an excellent job. <laughs> uh, Jimmy will present next. I yeah. believe his laptop is about to black out. Who? Jimmy? Yes. Okay, okay. So, 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 so Jimmy Muhozi Muhebua uh, has a master's in science, environment, and natural resources management from uh, Makerere University. Uh, he has a bachelor in science, botany, zoology, also from uh, Makerere University, and a diploma in education. Uh, his current position, uh, he works at the National Project, Project Coordinator African Crane Conservation Program, a a ACCP. The program is being implement implemented in five African countries of South Africa, Zambia, Kenya, Rwanda, and Uganda. However, ACCP is part of the global program implemented by the International Crane Foundation, ICF. In Uganda, the program is being implemented under the International Crane Foundation, Stroke Endangered Wildlife Trust, Stroke uh, Nature Uganda Partnership. Uh, so he is based in Uganda. As a natural resources manager for 18 years, uh, Mohebo has contributed to the Grey Crowned Crane Species Recovery through research and conservation action in Uganda with special focus in the central and southwestern Uganda. He is a weekly award winner in 2010 for his exceptional work on crane and wetland conservation in Uganda. He recently received a Species Recovery Award 2020, conferred to him by the government of Uganda. He, has, he says that his core values are professionalism, integrity, and trustworthiness. So, he 
is a family man married to the one and uh, he has uh, has uh, three kids so I, i'd like to welcome you i i i'd like to welcome uh, muhebo uh, to make his presentation welcome sir thank you uh I am sorry because some of the pronunciations is uh, difficult and I understand that, uh, but uh, you did the best to present me, to show me as somebody who is the best. I don't think that's all that I am, but thank you for doing all that. Five minutes that you gave me is rather too short, but I'm trying to fit, I try and fit within it. And directly I will uh, share my screen and then go direct to uh, the presentation that I'm to give. Uh, I hope the uh, presentation is coming up. Oh, yes, it's the... Oh, yes, I'm not going to repeat the topic of the presentation. And uh, I've already been introduced. I'm Jimmy Mohozi Mohewga, I'm based in Uganda. And I do my work, especially in the Southwest uh, of the country. I'm working on uh, natural resources management, but using cranes as uh, my flagship species. And um, I'm not going to read all that is here because it's a lot and uh, Gladys did well to introduce it, but uh, we need to know that wildlife trafficking threatens hundreds of species. Tigers, elephants, leopards, birds, and so on, but mostly benefit corruption and weak governments. If these two were worked on, I think uh, wildlife trafficking would be at its knees. Wildlife trafficking is hard to quantify because it is a highly concealed venture. People don't go out and show it. It's a black market. And we know that uh, by figures from traffic, that wildlife trade commands a lot of money, and this one is in billions. Actually, it uh, exceeds money from uh, things like, I think, are very cost. As I said uh, above, it benefits from corruption and weak governments. And because of the human population growth, like Gladys has just said, there is a lot of demand for these resources. And this demand drives the crime. This is why we have rhino horns being uh, taken away, why we have ivory being taken away and sold to rich countries like Asia and so on. Uh, but all this is because there, there are so many gaps in protection, there is corruption, ruthless laws, with judicial systems, and very, very, very light sentences. Somebody to be uh, imprisoned for like one month that it isn't a deterrent sentence. In Uganda, we know we have a very rich biodiversity. Because the world is remaining, the uh, world is uh, mountain dwellers. Gladys has talked about it. Recorded bird species, we have 50%. Global mammals, we have 39. Amphibians, we have 19%. Reptiles, we have 14. Species of fish, we have 14. So it's a rich biodiversity, and this one is a precursor for things like wider trafficking. Concerning the uh, legally traded sites, we know that in terms of birds, the canaries, the, what, there are birds we call yellow fronted canaries, these are the most traded in. But we also understand that gray parrots are caught a lot, they are sold, they are loved, and they command a very big market. And at Nature Uganda, where I am now based, we have found out that shoe bears and even gray crown cranes are uh, among the wildlife, especially the avifauna wildlife that are sold. And we know that Netherlands and Germany, we are the main import destinations. This was recorded by scientists. But now of, of recent, China, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates are some of the biggest consumers of the birds and other wildlife from Uganda. Other birds that are traded in, 
These are lovely birds. The bird in the front corner of my side is a red-headed love bird. It looks lovely. The great blue turaco is another great lovely bird. There is an eagle called the batera. It's a lovely bird. And the white-crested turaco, as they are illustrated on my uh, slide. In terms of cranes, which I work for, there are 15 crane species in the world, but of the 15, 11 species are threatened or endangered. Of these four are on the African continent, and all of them are threatened. In Uganda, we have two types, the gray crown and the black crown, and all these are being trafficked day and night. We know that this, uh, the global population has gone down from about 100,000 to about 6,000, uh, 60,000. Uh, uh, this is the recent estimate of around 2004 and it's continuing to decline. And some of the declines have already um, demonstrating them on the slides. These are young cranes that have been caught and we had to intercept the carpets and take them to court. The declines are mainly attributed to habitat loss, that this has already alluded to this, and fragmentation, mm -hmm. but trapping for domestication and international trade, especially illegal trade, mainly to Rwanda, to China, UAE, and even Tanzania, this has caused a lot of problems for the cranes. Trade routes are, they are, they are those low-level poachers. These are the people who run around and catch the cranes. From this, then they, from these, they are the second level. These are middlemen. They have some money, but not a lot. They buy cranes from the captors. Then we have the third level. These are the transporters. They deal in transportation from one place to the other in concealed boxes and in very, very crude methods. Some of them actually die. And this is where even this transmission happen. Then they are the fourth level urban middlemen. These have, have a lot of money and they buy and take to the kingpin who is seated somewhere in China or in UAE. Effects of wildlife trafficking. When wildlife animals are removed from their natural habitats uh, and they are brought into contact with, the, with humans and other animals under high, high stressful conditions and with little regard for their health or welfare needs, the chance of interspecies diseases transmission is very high. These animals that would usually never interact with the wild in the wild are placed in crumpled spaces, often stuck in cages, in highly stressful environments. The presence of bodily fluids like, like blood, like urine, like feces, provides conditions in which viruses can transmit between species. And as humans encounter these wildlife in such environments, or consume them, they eat them, of course, the risk of transmitting the diseases increases. These diseases may then spread through human contact and lead to global pandemics with devastating social, economic, health conservations. What don't you see right now? Other effects are interruption of, of nature, of exploitation, scare too. Invasive species may emerge, find species that never used to be here, they will come in, and in most cases, they compete with the native species. It's dental killing. Sometimes when they are targeting cranes, they find they are killing eagles or some other non-target species. How can we combat this? Here is where we work with the media to unearth trafficking information, make it known to the public, and call for public action by all responsible agencies. On my part, I've regularly, for my 18, 19 years, have regularly engaged with this. The new vision, televisions like TV West, radios like Radio West, Voice of Chigas, it's radio in Kabare, NTV is a TV station, NBS, name it, name it, to make current trade cases known by all and sundry, and we call for action to be taken now and not later. And the media, has not let us down. Global wildlife trade is regulated by uh, CITES. The aim of this agreement is to ensure that international trade in specimens of these animals and plants does not threaten their survival. However, as I told you, this is a concealed venture. 
So Irrigo Wide Wife Paid is conducted covertly and it operates outside of these regulatory systems. There are no minimum requirements for animal welfare. There are no minimum requirements for health and sanitation. As a result, we have COVID-19 pandemic with us and its effect, as you can see, and it's what we are trying to address. In conclusion, while the world's attention is on COVID right now, we must not ignore the global health implications of dozens of other zoonotic diseases, which infect and kill millions of people annually. Other viruses, both known and unknown, may are yet to evolve and to spill over from wide to human. We need to get a greater understanding of the causes of zoonosis and threats to biodiversity and humans that arise from this unregulated, unsustainable, unsanitary, and high stress trade in wild animals. In fact, governments should take urgent, cohesive, and meaningful action to tackle all forms of illegal wildlife trade using evidence based approaches to minimize risks to conservation, risks to health, and risks to safety. Human health and nature are in inextricably linked, and the current COVID-19 pandemic demonstrates a need for enhanced global responses that are addressing this illegal wider trade. Thank you for listening to me all. Thank you, thank you, uh, Jimmy. Uh, I think we are running uh, behind the schedule. Uh, I hope that um, we, we, we speed up um, our presentation. So, uh, Gerald Tenua Magumba is a senior reporter at New Vision. He is a conservation journalist and filmmaker. He has been reporting for the last two decades covering wildlife, ivory trafficking, forests, wetlands, pollution, oil, land, water, and climate change and governance issues relating to conservation. He also covers extractives, including oil and minerals. He has won 20 awards, including the Ozone Africa Media Award in 2011, given by UNEP, and CNN Media Award for Environment in 2012, as well as the Nile Media Award in 2015. His qualifications include a diploma in media and land governance in 2016 offered by MSTCDC at Arusha in Tanzania. Postgraduate diploma in environment, journalism, and communication at Makerere University in 2007, and Bachelor of Science degree in forestry at Makerere University in 1994. He takes matters of the environment in a passionate way. He has covered most of the big stories on climate change, pollution, and trafficking of wildlife trophies, including stealing of ivory from government stores in Uganda. He has been trained by an American professor. Will Zavala in, Peters, in Pittsburgh University on how to make documentaries. This is going to help his take on uh, investigative stories on the environment and also expose corruption in the natural resources sector. He also mentors young reporters interested in reporting on the environment, climate change, and extractives such as oil and uh, minerals. Over to you, uh, Gerald. Thank you so much, uh, my young brother, Geoffrey. Uh, I would like to say thank you so much to everybody who is involved in this. This is my first opportunity to speak on such a platform. Uh, I would like to say thank you for the compliments from my sister and uh, OG Gladys Kalema. And thank you for your work in the, in the area of conservation. Um, I would like to point out uh, three things which we, we miss uh, as reporters who interface with conservation. One of them is understanding the story. This is a question you must always ask yourself. Do you understand the story? In many cases, we don't. We don't appreciate uh, the story which is about the ecosystem, we, we are writing about COVID, the lake levels in this region, and water disasters. 
have become the order of the day, simply because the ecosystem has broken down. And the ecosystem that should protect people are now very weak, and the people who are vulnerable are suffering. But we never took trouble to find out what the state of this ecosystem one year ago, or two years ago, or 10 years ago. All these debates and uh, um, seminars about sustainable development, they have gone to waste because COVID, the rising levels of Lake Victoria, the locusts have exposed all of us. What do we need to report on environment? There are three key things. One is being passionate about this subject. There are many frustrations, just like I've been talking about, writing about sustainable development and all these things to do with the lake, the Ramsar uh, uh, sites, and nothing, no critical steps are taken to be able to safeguard the population. So if you are not passionate, you cannot be able to advance this cause. The second one is being knowledgeable, which I've touched, up, uh, touched on. You must know the science. You must know the governance linkages to these stories. You must write an interesting story. Nobody is going to read your story, even if it's about the most exciting thing. When you don't write it well, people read a few paragraphs and say, this is a waste of space and airtime. So you have to be passionate, and this should be also seen from the kind of knowledge you have and the way how you weave the story. How you check on the power centers, the power structures that are not doing the right thing. Those are very key when you are reporting on the environment. You have to be persistent. Some of these problems we are seeing today started a long time ago. COVID, locusts, and even the rising levels of, of Lake Victoria, they didn't start yesterday. The actions that have led us there have been on for quite some time. But people don't listen. Even in a newsroom, you take time to labor to explain the story you are going to do. And the editor is not seeing that it's urgent. But you have to be persistent to report on such bits consistently. The other one is empathy, the ability to be able to step in different shoes to be able to expose the wrongdoers. You step in the shoes of the community person. You step in the shoes of an activist. You step in the shoes of government and ask all critical questions. You also ask the experts, the academia, to be able to understand, to ask the right questions to the different stakeholders. Going back to, to the point uh, about the, the, some of the stories which I've uh, written in the past 20 years, I've been around for some time. Um, I've picked out five key stories. One of them is a story I covered early when I just started my career in 2003. There was a group of Congolese, three Congolese, who are working with Ugandans to smuggle a chimpanzee. We call them also chimps here in Uganda. And uh, I got this information from a good source. And I managed to embed myself in the whole structure that was going to buy the chimpanzee. But I was also able to work with the Jen Goodall Institute and the Chimpanzee Trust. And we laid a trap together with Uganda Wildlife Authority. And we were able to save this chimpanzee in 2003. Uh, unfortunately, the chimpanzee was not looked after well during captivity. It had lost weight, it was wasted, and uh, the expert said probably its weight had cut by about half. It looked sick, it looked scared when we looked at it in the eye. I got sad. I also cried because there was a life at stake. A day after saving this chimpanzee, it passed on. I got so sad. Unknown to us, the same group had uh, links to another one, which still had another chimpanzee. And through uh, investigations, we were able to save the second chimpanzee. And I was given an opportunity to name that chimpanzee. And I named it in the Akira. That chimpanzee is still alive and it lives on Namba Island in the middle of Lake Victoria. That was my first biggest story to do with uh, wildlife trafficking, way back in 2003. 
Along the way, I've also covered other stories to do with ivory. And another memorable one is uh, from the men of God, the pastors, from somewhere in Toroko. This is uh, near the border, the border between Uganda and, and Congo. These pastors are supposed to um, tell people, men and women, to turn to God. And this is what they do on Sundays. But on this particular day in the middle of the week, I think it was a Wednesday or Thursday, they were caught with uh, ivory weighing about 200 kilograms. This was an opportunistic story uh, and, uh, because they were arrested by Uganda Wildlife Authority and I was called in to go and report. But this story led me to several others because I was able to understand how the crime network operates and I was able to uh, make very good linkages to Semuliki National Park and Queen Elizabeth National Park. And subsequently, I wrote about five big stories, investigative stories, as a result. Um, one key story um, which is shocking is that uh, in many cases, just like I pointed out earlier, that uh, you must be empathetic when you're doing these stories so that you step in the shoes of several actors, but at the same time remain neutral and do that story. It's a story about um, a government agency, which like the pastor is supposed to be checking crime and telling people to change and to enforce the law. Was caught pants down. One ton of ivory went missing from the stores of Uganda Wildlife Authority. This happened to be one of my good sources. But I have a principle. I'll be your friend as long as the right thing is being done. When the wrong thing is done, I'm a journalist, I have to expose it. I was able to do this uh, through networking with some good friends of mine who were able to leak this to me. And they, also able, they were able to provide me with the evidence, a report, which was revealing several counts, like about three counts, and which confirmed that indeed, one ton of ivory had gone missing. This was in 20, 2018. Um, apart from this, um, I've also done a number of uh, stories. We have the rich men in this country, the tycoons, the alpha and the omegas in this world, who go and throw their weight on the leg reclaiming parts of the, hot, the, 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 the lake to construct hotels, build flower farms in some ecologically sensitive areas, including Ramza sites, which my sister Chepet talked about earlier. I was able to expose all this wrongdoing. Um, since we are bad by time, and uh, I'll have another time to, to talk about this, I'll go straight to um, the lessons. Briefly, this is what you should expect if you are going to be a critical reporter in this area. One of them is that uh, if you are reporting about wildlife, and that's where I started from, make sure you are knowledgeable. You must have the facts. You have the facts, you have the story. You don't have the facts, don't pretend you have no story. I'm telling you from experience, if you do a story without facts, it will be those half facts or quarter facts which will be used against you, and you will go down crashing. Investigate your stories, interpret them, be empathetic, talk to all the different stakeholders, make a rounded story. You will have the prey in the snare. They will have nowhere to run. When I did the story about the one ton of ivory missing at Uganda Wildlife Authority, the first attack, attack was on uh, CEO, Mr. Robert Kavshenga. Another attack was directed at Robert, at Barbara Kaija, the editor-in-chief. And they all asked me, do you have copies of the reports indicating that there is missing ivory was so much? He said, yes. Here it is on the flash and the hard copy. 
Just imagine if I didn't have that report. And I can tell you, I was getting information from inside, and they were telling me that uh, there were efforts by the top leadership of Uganda Wildlife Authority at that time to falsify the, a copy of the report which I had. But successfully, the good men and women in there, they refused to bow to pressure to falsify the report. And the story stood. Another lesson is that uh, um, people who are caught in wildlife crime are normally small people. The ones who do that, that job, the poor men and women, especially men, the poachers, some middlemen, the guys who are doing this thing a big time somewhere in the capitals of Congo, Kinshasa. Some of them have shifted base and they are based in Kampala. Some are in Western capitals and the Asian capitals. Those are the real guys. And in many cases, the kind of stories we do, we just simply scratch on, on the top. One ton of ivory missing. Where did it come from? How did it get there? And in many cases, you can't imagine some of these shameless people, they got this ivory, stole it, and it was recovered with some other people who were trafficking it. And some of the cases ended there. The IGG was called in to investigate twice this matter. And up to now, five years down the road, three years down the road, we do not know who stole the ivory. Can you imagine? There are all these government agencies which are paid by the taxpayers, my hard and money, your money. They can't tell us who the thieves are. They still drive in the posh cars. They move inside in and they pass us when we are locked in a, in a jam. That's the nature of the crime. The third one is that uh, the systems which are set up to, uh, the governance systems that are set up to fight this crime. In some cases, they are part and parcel of this crime. These fellows are the ones who will go. Um, can, can I get help? Jeremy. These guys, um, the governance systems which are set up to, to, um, to enforce the law, they are part and parcel of the problem in some cases. Um, I've told you a case where uh, one ton of ivory went missing from the coffers, from the stores of Uganda Wildlife Authority. And a few months down the road, the same ivory was recovered from another set of thieves. We've seen in that very case, actually, there were cases which were not investigated properly. There was a ranger who was so enthusiastic to give evidence to people who are investigating and was ready to be interviewed. Unfortunately, he was never interviewed. About two weeks later, after he expressed interest to be interviewed, he was killed in cold blood. And the people who came to do a report, the investigation from the police, they indicated he committed suicide. I don't think this was the case. So you have to be um, knowledgeable. You must uh, have good networks. You must be able to link up, uh, connect the dots. You must also make sure yourself when you are connecting these dots. Because the very people who shot down that ranger, if you are not careful, they will also come for you. This is not to scare you, but to tell you that you have to be careful when you are investigating. The last point is about uh, culture and conservation. Um, my friend, Dr. Gladys Karema, talked about this earlier, about the Golida rules, seven meters between the Golidas and the people who are seeing the Golidas. And some of them are violated. Actually, this is also one of the things which I, I wrote about years ago. I got some enemies because um, they were saying I was against the institution, but I managed to pull it off. But to go back to the point, why seven meters between the visitors, the trackers of Golidas and the Golidas? This has come out of culture. 
the culture of people who live in southwestern Uganda, the Bachiga. These guys believe that if you are going out to hunt and you find gorillas, you decide to go back because it's a bad omen. You don't proceed where you are going to, to do your business in the forest. And uh, in a way, this limits the interaction between gorillas and human beings because it shows that if you've met them, chances are high that you'll encounter them again, probably inside the forest when you're picking whatever you have to pick, all on the way back. And uh, this has been the basis. These Bachigas have been doing this for centuries. And people who came in yesterday as Uganda Wildlife Authority, they have come up, the Gladys Kalemas, they have come up with, uh, with the Gorilla rules. It shows that culture, which people understand best, and the cultural norms. If we understood it very well where it is still rich and build on it, we can achieve conservation. In an area called Mabamba on Lake Victoria in Wakiso, about 40 kilometers from Kampala, people who are going to fish, if they find a shoebill, or called bulwe, which is also another species, that is being um, trafficked. These guys will not go out to hunt to fish because they know it's a bad omen. This is also something which helps to control the fishing pressure. And it comes again and again, but because so many people who are So have we lost uh, Gerald? Can anybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you. I think Gerald has gone off for now. Okay, okay. So I think also that uh, he was uh, already concluding. So I think. Um, uh, he made uh, very interesting points, no facts, no stories, and that uh, in order to report on some of these environmental issues, you need passion, uh, become knowledgeable, and understand the science, as well as uh, being persistent. So our last but not least uh, uh, presenter will be Anthony Ochien. Anthony Ochien is a wildlife ecologist, conservation photographer, and emerging filmmaker. He's a Jackson Wild Emerging Filmmaker Scholar, WWF Education for Nature Grantee, and a WWF Africa Youth Award nominee in 2018. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Wildlife Management from, from Moy University. He's the founder of Tony Wild, a platform for promoting conservation action by creating awareness on wildlife conservation through photography, film, and science as well as uh, being the co-founder of Biophilic Conservations, a platform whose aim is inspiring a community of young African professional conservationists. His images have been featured in the following platforms, Climate Tracker, Global Landscape Forum. He is a bronze winner of the Safari Eye in the World 2019, and a finalist for the following photography competitions. Global Landscape Forum, Kyoto and Accra, Heart of Kenya, an Icon Kenya competition, and Peak Fair Celebrating Africa City Life category. Welcome, Mr. Ochim. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, uh, and for the presentation. Uh, I'll just go straight to my presentation, just to save on time.
So, so my passion is purely wildlife conservation. I have a training in wildlife uh, management and conservation and uh, obsession in uh, mostly uh, photography and film. So the concept of how Tony Wild started was based on, we all interact with wildlife on a daily basis uh, from morning to evening, but not all of us understand this. So uh, we need to package this particular information in a manner that all of us understand this. Uh, and that's the reason why uh, I began Tony Wild. So Tony Wild uh, is a platform that uses uh, uh, photography to link uh, people and conservation science. Uh, and uh, through that, I use uh, uh, I use uh, film photography and uh, and science. So this uh, came up to this particular uh, pro program. So where we have conservation photography where well, we give the public a chance to interact with uh, conservation at a personal level. So in this case, uh, we show through images of film, people actually working in conservation and also the threats that wildlife face, including the particular species themselves, because people don't really understand that wildlife is just more than the big five. We have uh, bats, we have bats, we have insects, we have reptiles living with us. So once we understand that and respect that, we start respecting wildlife and we coexist with them. That is actually the main aim. Uh, the other program we have, Visual Ecological Literacy Program, where we offer reality based environmental education by creating content in the school we visit. So, as much as there's content around, we create content where the kids can actually relate with the one they can see day to day, the birds, the, the, the plants. Uh, with that, now we give them an entry point into nature so they can actually understand. And then last year, the mitigation project, which is now more of a four-year project where uh, we mainly aim on behavior change because all of, all of this happens because we focus mostly on, on trying to have behavior change rather than just have a call to action, but have people start taking uh, continuous in a more to do it, but to do it because all of stories are uh, island chimpanzee trust and the threats that the chimpanzees face are in non-infrastructures because the problem of Nairobi River is we do not have proper infrastructures to manage the waste management. Uh, so this is my, my take. Uh, we as, uh, uh, as communicators need to understand the science. We need to really simplify the conservation uh, papers pretty much well. After simplifying them, we, we allow them to have a human aspect. Uh, when I say the human aspect, try to relate your story to, to your locality. Because if you, if you come to the international field, this is what they'll say, that that, is, that does not affect us. It affects people from a different country. But when you're coming up with the wildlife uh, or communication platforms for wildlife, you try and narrow, narrow it down to that particular uh, ecosystem or place you actually stay with. Uh, and then link it up to uh, contemporary issues. And for this case, we have like COVID-19. So how do you communicate importance of wildlife uh, conservation with zoonotic diseases such as COVID-19? And then you need to really package that information uh, and create that awareness because not, not everybody or not everybody actually has access to internet or read the papers or listen to radio, but you need to package that information in a simpler way. To actually show them that Wildlife is key to not only uh, them themselves, but to sustain uh, the whole life as a, as a whole. So I strongly believe that wildlife conservation is the base of any economic, any economic, political, or social issues of a country. Like right now, we are actually in that particular state. We as conservationists understand this, but not everyone does. So we need to carefully package that message and share it with every household in the world that wildlife conservation are the principles that safeguards our way of life. Therefore, we need to start respecting, not even start, we need to continuously respect and protect wildlife. So how do I make my mom understand that wildlife is important? 
is by telling them that wildlife is life. Wildlife is cool and it's everywhere. We mess up with it, it affects us in one or another. Because we share, we, sh we, we share that pathogens can jump from one wildlife species to us in, in different ways. Uh, so that's just much about me and uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Anthony, for a very well uh, explained presentation. Uh, we need to localize uh, the stories so that they have the desired impact uh, on society. So right now, I think uh, we need to move into the Q&A session because now, you know, time is not on our side. Uh, the questions will be, I will ask the question for the five panelists. Uh, and I uh, will start with um, Dr. Gladys. Uh, what steps uh, do we take to minimize the chances of people acquiring infectious diseases from uh, wild animals such as uh, gorillas? Thank you. Okay, yeah, thanks for that question. Um, I kind of tried to answer it in the chat, but basically anything that brings us in close contact with wildlife means that we can make each other sick. So one way that a lot of people have got sick from animals is by touching them. And in some parts of the world where people feel that if you eat a gorilla, you can become as strong as a gorilla, um, people have actually died of diseases like Ebola. So gorillas got Ebola from something in the forest, which we don't know yet, and they died. They're not the cause of it. They, they died when they got in contact with that thing. And people who ate them or hunters who hunted them and skinned them died. And so families were dying in Central Africa because of eating animals that have died of Ebola. So the same thing can happen with all kinds of different species. And much of what uh, Dr. Jane Goodo said, if you don't respect animals, they can make you sick and you can make them sick. And that's actually how COVID-19 came about, not respecting animals enough. It re resulted in the virus jumping from animals to people. Okay, and just to follow up on that, um, uh, viruses, uh, virus, viruses uh, jumping species, uh, could you explain how that occurs, as well as um, why is it that um, uh, these viruses do not affect uh, the host animals? Thank you. Um, very, a lot of the times, the host animals are not affected, like the ones where the virus originates from. A lot of the time, they're not affected, but they can spread it to another animal. And that's because they've learned to live with the virus. They've learned to live with the pathogen. But when it jumps from them to somebody else, to some other animal, then it becomes infectious because they've not learned to live with it. And from what we're reading about Corona, it's learned how to, it's understood its host and it's learned how to colonize in its host very quickly and can make its host very sick. So it's very important that we, we, are, we, in, we don't, you know, like things like deforestation, going into swamps, as uh, Dr. Jimmy mentioned, and all these other things that, lead us more and more into destroying the environment, destroying the forests, the habitats, puts us into closer contact with wild animals that we're not supposed to be in such close contact with and enabling, and if, especially if you bring them into congested markets like what happened in Wuhan, it's a very ideal situation for something to jump from one species to another through breathing and through touching. So it's actually very important to, yeah, to be very careful when you're handling such species. Okay, so uh, I have uh, two other questions here for you, uh, Doctor. Uh, how does your organization work with journal journalists in terms of uh, capacity building? And, uh, and um, how, how are other animals protected against uh, diseases uh, being transmitted from gorillas and other animals uh, or 
uh, human beings? Um, I, I would say that the second question I've kind of answered in the previous one. Mm -hmm. um, for example, to prevent us making gorillas sick or other animals, we have to maintain a respectable distance. Um, but then the, the one of how journalists, how we work with journalists, um, we find that journalists are really helping us to promote our message. You know, they help us in advocacy. And we've had two media study tours to Gwindi, and where journalists have come and interviewed us, interviewed the communities that we're working with, the partners we're working with, gone and seen the, seen the gorillas, and understood how the work that we're doing is impacting the communities. And through that, they've been able to educate other people about what we're doing. A lot of media articles came out because of these study tours. So I believe that if journalists can look for organizations and do study tours, they can really understand what people are doing. And if, you know, like sometimes you need to get your message out and some, one of the best ways is through the media. And I also think a lot of the time, you know, a lot of people don't trust journalists, to tell you the truth. Now we're that on this forum. <laughs> a lot of people think that journalists are, you know, just looking for stories, negative stories to make them look bad. And we need to, I think there needs to be more trust built between journalists and government institutions and NGOs and private sector, you know, donors. There needs to be a forum of building more trust. And a forum like this one, this panel is a very good way of doing it. But I believe that it can be a win-win situation for journalists and practitioners in the field. And we have had a really, we really appreciate the media that really helps to get our messages out. Mm. So uh, two last questions for you. Uh, one is about uh, tourism by satellite, whether it's an option. And I think that ties in very well with the uh, Gorilla Coffee, uh, Gorilla Conservation Coffee Initiative that uh, you have. So how viable is this uh, uh, tourism by satellite? Then uh, there is uh, this question about um, uh, involving journalists in the entire game of um, human and wildlife co uh, conflict, which I, I think also you, you, you can uh, explain in terms of uh, the Hugo project that, that you have, the human gorilla uh, conflict. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, tourism by satellite is a very viable way of conserving the wildlife. A time like this in the pandemic where there are no flights come, leaving anywhere to come to Africa, people can't even leave their homes to go to the national parks. If, if you can pay a small subscription to see what is going on in the national park or the, wild, or the wildlife education set or places like that and maintain them, you're able to pay for basic things that need to be done, feeding animals in the zoos, maintaining patrols in the national park for law enforcement. It can really help. And that may be something, just as like we're having so many virtual meetings now, <laughs> I'm sure if it wasn't for COVID, we'd be in one room today. But you know, because of so many virtual meetings, you know, people are now getting used to that. And if they can pay for to see this wildlife, there's Vico Tours by Dr. Ian Redmond, who worked a lot with Diane Fossey, and he's heading the Ape Alliance. And he has an organization that does a lot of that, virtual tourism, three-dimensional. It's really amazing. So I think we need to start to encourage that. And then regarding human wildlife conflict, it's a very contentious issue with wildlife conservation. It's so hard to make people protect wildlife when it's destroying their property, destroying their crops, sometimes even these fatal accidents. It's really, it's a tricky one. It's a very tricky one. But the more, what we do is, uh, it's very important to work with the local community who are directly affected in addressing this conflict issue. And if journalists can come and report such stories, it can really help. It will motivate communities in one area to learn about communities in another area. But definitely journalists should come and start create, reporting positive stories about human wildlife, conflict solutions that are working. Because a lot of the time it's like the elephant destroyed this, the elephant killed somebody, the, the hippos did this. Those are the stories that come out a lot in the media most of the time. But it would be good to get stories about this is how it's being resolved and how can we make this better so that other people can learn from lessons learned. Uganda can learn from Kenya or different countries from, can learn from each other how to address these issues because they're very real. Lions eat goats, you know, tigers eat 
all over the world, human wildlife conflicts is really undermining the, the success or the potential for conservation. And the more that we can share the success stories, the better through the media. Thank you so much, uh, Doctor. Uh, Thank you. My next questions are directed at uh, Jimmy. Uh, I hope uh, Jimmy is uh, listening. Uh, so, Jimmy, how do you address the captivity of uh, parrots? Uh, that's uh, the first question. And I, I would also like for you to talk about, um, uh, for example, uh, the, the for example, the, 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 the film, the video that we watched about um, Jane Goodall, uh, she was talking about how humans are um, destroying uh, the, the environment without knowing that uh, they are harming themselves. So uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, the destruction of the crane habitat in Uganda, but especially how this has a direct impact on human beings? Thank you. Hi, Jeffrey. I believe, unfortunately, Jimmy has gone off uh, due to power issues. Okay. Then we move on. Uh, then I suggest we move on. Uh, Gerald? I'm there. Okay, you're there. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, for you, uh, you know, culture and its application in conservation management is critical, yet very interesting. Uh, is it documented in various parts of the country or the continent? How culture, how culture and its application uh, is helping conserve and manage uh, the environment? Also, wow. how do you ensure safety? while uh, while on a trail during your investigative uh, uh, duties uh, culture cultural conservation um, is important in uh, in Uganda uh, just like elsewhere in Africa and other parts of Asia and uh, particularly I told you about the case of um, um, the, the the bachiga where the gorillas are found in southwestern Uganda there's a the bit of keeping the distance. And uh, this also happens, it's repeated elsewhere. There's a place called Musamba Island in the middle of Lake Victoria, where uh, fishermen never aggress snakes and the snakes also do not harass them. And they can coexist together. And this happens also to be a big migratory destination for the gray-headed girl. So some of this information has been well documented by an organization called Fula and Fauna International, and also Nature Uganda, which is a bird life international partner here in Uganda. And uh, both of these two institutions have engaged Uganda Wildlife Authority to develop guidelines that can be used to integrate um, culture into conservation. And uh, this is um, alive and well mostly in uh, the, the parks that are located on the mountains, like Rezori, the culture of the, the Bakonzo is very strong and there's a very big attachment between these people and the mountains. The same is true with Elgon. There's also um, a grassland park called Lake Mburu, where the Wahima um, think they own uh, that land. And uh, this has been always the case until conservation was introduced in this area. And then the two were delinked. Uganda Wildlife Authority and FFI, Florida and Fauna International, are going back to, 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 to that kind of conservation to marry the two. The conservation and respect the Bahima have for their cattle and the land. Uh, elsewhere in Africa, there's a place um, um, in Mombasa, in Kilifi, to be exact. There are people called the Kayas, and I can say, Kaya, Kaya, then they would respond, Kaya. These guys respect their landscape, they respect their forests, they don't cut trees, they have uh, formulated uh, bylaws which restrict um, tree cutting, anyhow. 
and they don't also bury their dead in cemented graves. And it's um, the practice of these people is eco-friendly. These are the forms of culture I'm talking about. There are also examples which I was reading where the World Conservation Union, IUCN, is working with different groups in Nepal, where communities um, conserve protected areas because they, they live next door. And, and, and the conservation of that kind, cultural conservation, does not cost much to enforce because the people are already living there. They have had to chase away all the rangers who don't need to protect these areas. So yes, it's documented, and Uganda is, is moving to embrace this kind of conservation. And then the second question about safety. Anything, um, uh, any human activity has a risk. Even crossing a road, even cooking food, you can uh, easily burn the house if you turn on gas badly. But to get to the point, um, you have to understand the level of risk that is uh, associated with a story and uh, be able to draw a good plan on how to mitigate that risk you're exposed to. I'll tell you an example. As a young reporter many years ago, I would get, I would walk for part of the journey home, another part I would jump on a taxi, another part I jump on a motorcycle, and I would end up at an uncle's place. So that I would be able to um, create uh, unpredictability because if you are predictable and people are seeing you, this is the way you come, this is the way you go, it's very easy to lay a trap for you and get you. Sometimes I would sleep in the newsroom to be able to make sure that uh, nobody is going to hurt me until the story is out. But the biggest tool, which is even within your control, is to write a factual story, an accurate story, very well explained, and once it comes out, almost 99% or 100% of the risk will go. But if you do a story which is uh, just there in the middle, then you're in big time trouble. Most of these guys who want to hurt you, they'll have nothing to protect once the story is out and it is square, it is clear and 100% accurate. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Gerald. You're welcome. So uh, I think, uh, we need to hear also from uh, uh, Caroline Ch Chebet. Caroline, I wonder whether you you can hear me. Caroline? I can hear you. I, I can hear you. Okay, good. Very, very good. So uh, I, I, I'd like for you to uh, share with us about uh, the key challenges of uh, reporting on wildlife uh, and um, in the perspective of uh, the story that you did in the Mau Forest in 2018, yes. uh, which led uh, to the development of that particular swamp, as well as uh, the Lake Kamnarok uh, National Reserve. Thank you. Yes, uh, particularly on the security of journalists when they are going to, to pursue their stories. They are usually challenges and they are part of our work. Mostly, mo mo mostly they are, especially when you are doing so, uh, sensitive stories on deforestation, on wildlife trafficking, they are usually a lot of, they are, they are not, they, they, they are usually very sensitive because it involves it, it, it involves, very, they, they, they usually involve very powerful people in the society. There was even one I, I did at, uh, it, it, was, it, it was a story on the Kenya lake system. The, it was on Lake Elementaita. This lake is a, a world famous lake. It is part of the Kenya lake system, but the lake has been fenced. And uh, basically, this lake should be enjoying the, the security, the, the international and local laws. But still, you find most of these, these lakes are encroached. And when you go and try to, to follow up the, these stories, there are usually people who, who don't want to, who don't want to, 
you to air such a story. But we have always devised ways because once you have sources on the ground, when, once your sources are good and you have your, your evidences, as long as you have evidences for your story, you, you are good. Even when they sue you and you have evidence, you are, you are okay. They are, on, even on the other story we did on Lake, uh, the story I did on Lake Kamnarok, there was a time we were followed by some, I think that there was some, some information that leaked that there was some, some people who were seen taking photos in that lake. So they sent some, there were some spies, they came and stopped us and it is in, in the forest. So they were, they were asking us what we wanted to do, particularly in the forest, because they had fenced the, the lake. In, in the, they had enclosed the lake and they had already fenced. So it is a, they are very critical challenges, but these stories, at the end of the day, we need to tell them. We need to save these lakes. We need to save this wildlife. We need to highlight that this plight for the governments and authorities to act and do their work. So, and uh, I think also having the, the, the networks really help help us cover, cover these stories. Because if, if, when, we are, when we are dealing with stories like encroach on, on the deforestation, we usually depend on these people who are on the ground. We depend on these, these, these people who, who tell us, who tip us on what is happening on the ground. So when we go there, they, of course also they, they know the danger. Even in this, in this forest, I can hear you. I can hear you. I think, uh, I think, uh, Gerald, uh, uh, do, yes. you mind, uh, do you mind? Do you mind muting your your mic, please? Sure. And also, how how we usually get our stories? How how we source? Where we source our stories? We usually depend on on re, also on reports on international reports whenever they they release international local we depend on scientists we depend on experts even on 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 networks on networking with other journalists that is where we we get this information like the trafficking of pangolins there was a very there is a, a very interesting report the this united nations office on drugs and crimes recently released on April 22nd. It is talking on, on the linking the pangolins and the current pandemic on COVID. It is a very interesting story where we can all explore and really tell stories on link on the stories on trafficking and the spread of zoonotic diseases. There. I think I have answered a few. I'm sure, I'm sure you have, I'm sure you have. I think uh, your media house, uh, the Standard Media Group is doing a very commendable job. If you can yes. be highlighting wildlife uh, conservation stories on a daily basis, like you said, mm -hmm. I think that's a very big uh, step forward. So, uh, yes. yeah, so finally, we'll have uh, to hear from uh, Antonio Chien. Antonio Chien says, the story needs to be localized. Antonio Chien? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, what I mean is, uh, what I mean uh, uh, the story to be localized is that we, we need to start thinking about how we communicate uh, because if you continue communicating fear that is not close to a particular person they'll take it for granted uh, just for instance let's take for the case of COVID-19 when it was being communicated in China people in Africa didn't take it that serious They're like this is something that is just passed or it's just meant for the people who are in in the other countries so but we've tried other ways to really localize uh, our communication especially when it comes to wildlife uh, just to echo what Dr. Gladys had mentioned earlier, that, that we need to start telling 
positive stories, because these positive stories are, are what us human beings relate with. We, we are psychologically uh, put in place where we want to receive positive information at all points in our lives. So if you share more negative information, people get to a point where they feel it's not a crisis and there's nothing we can actually do. So we just let it go. But if you communicate positive aspect, it inspires people to actually take action to continuously support uh, the conservation of wildlife. Uh, because people have different attitudes towards wildlife. There are those who are interested in wildlife trade. There are those who will go towards how climate change affects wildlife. Uh, there are those who will actually mention in more detail, uh, in more detail uh, how the neighboring wildlife actually affects their day-to-day -day basis. So in summary, we just need to really, really simplify uh, our communicating language. Uh, we need to make it uh, in a manner that my, in quote, quote, mama mboga, the, mom, the mother who sells me mboga at my local kiosks can actually understand that I need to protect the environment because it has a bigger impact on my day-to-day -day activities. So this is just, uh, we can either use photography, film, radio, the different types of media, but then you need to figure out which one can actually reach, uh, reach most of the people in a very proper way. So in short, make it simple. At the same time, do not communicate too much of urgency because all of us are actually afraid of urgency. We are afraid of, of negative information. Try and document something positive that inspire other people. Talk about people who are doing conservation and everything else. So that's what I'll add on uh, at the moment. Thank you. So I was, I was just about to ask you about um, uh, you being a wildlife uh, ecologist uh, expert. Uh, I, I wanted to know. Uh, can, uh, can you talk uh, about uh, the issue of funding? Because uh, uh, conservation uh, efforts now are facing very dire uh, situation, given the lockdown that we are facing. So uh, how, how, uh, how, uh, how can we, uh, how can funding be, 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 be accessed at this uh, particular, in this particular situation that we are facing uh, the, the, in the glo global pandemic? Uh, so funding has definitely affected uh, the, whole, the whole space, uh, not just wildlife alone, but also other sectors. Uh, but natural resources have been affected because they actually, uh, the world GDP uh, gets, the world GDP is actually most, half of it is from, natural resources uh, directly or moderately. So one is that organizations that have funding just need to actually communicate to their donors in, in time, especially tell them that because they understand the situations. That is one particular point. But then we need to tailor make social uh, enterprises that can actually support conservation, uh, conservation actions because conservation is for the people. And the people need to understand that conservation is important. If somebody does not deem it important, they will not support it. So in terms of funding, it varies from one point to another. Uh, because I'll, I'll be happy if Africans will actually support and continuously fund conservation and wildlife in the country, either in Kenya, Uganda, or Tanzania. That would be my joy. But we get most of our funding from the good owners and uh, from the government and actually to support uh, wildlife and conservation issues. But we need to really tell them that this is important. And I think the COVID-19 crisis actually put, put us in that particular point, whereby uh, tourism is important, but wildlife is actually way, way important. Because without that, that wildlife is the one that connects us to other uh, zoonotic diseases issues. It's the one that actually sustains our life. So, even if we do not have tourism going on at the moment, I know it affects very major cause of, uh, of wildlife operations, but we need the locals to actually start appreciating and actually taking voluntary measures to protect the wildlife. Uh, and when I mention protect wildlife is that taking actions. If I need to support uh, see, uh, uh, Dr. Gladys and I have something else, I can actually contribute. 
as an African to support the conservation of, uh, of gorillas in, in, in Uganda. So it's all a matter of figuring out what other sources of income do we need to go for. I'm, I'm, I'm pro-social enterprises where you give a, uh, you give a service uh, to, to either a corporate world and the corporate world pays you for that service and that particular amount you get, you reinvest it back into, into conservation of wildlife. Because we need to let the corporates know that it gets to a point where profit has to be enough. Because sometimes the corporate world, world, world goes beyond and actually affects uh, conservation in one or another. So just in summary one, we need to look at our own uh, local funds and push the government at this particular point to create funds that can actually protect wildlife and support wildlife conservation, because this has really been overseen over a very long period of time. Two, if there are funders existing, we maintain them and ensure that they understand the current situation. Uh, but let's have the government take role in conserving wildlife. Uh, three, how people appreciate that wildlife is important. And it's important not only just for tourism, but for the way of life. Uh, and uh, the last and the final one is we need to talk to the corporates. And when I mean talk to the corporates, let them understand that there's a point where they can make their profits to where it is enough. And when I mention enough is where when they start making major impact, especially on, on, uh, on wildlife, uh, on wildlife uh, effects or environmental issues, that is where we actually uh, create and tell them, you know what, you've done enough, you've done produced so much plastics, you've, uh, you've uh, cut down a, a large patch of forest area uh, due to just production of a particular product. So we just need to have a stand balance. So for now, as the COVID crisis, my recommendation is that African conservationists and those who are passionate about conservationists, which I mean should be everybody in the African content, continent should now lobby and tell the government, actually, do you know what? You need to allocate more funds to wildlife conservation because it is critical to not only your survival as a, as a, as a, as a country, but also to our survival. So that's all I'll say. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Anthony, for uh, that very insightful um, uh, input. Uh, so I, I, I don't know. The, the next session was about uh, question and answer still, but this session uh, was supposed to be for the online audience. So I don't know because time has really gone. So I wonder what Annika and uh, Frederick think uh, we should do. Uh, yeah, thank you, Jeffrey, and thank you so much for leading this very important discussion. I think it's really been a fascinating um, time today, and it's been amazing to hear from all of the panelists. Uh, I think we are out of time now, but we'd like to let you know that it doesn't end here. You can post your questions online, tag us at InfoNile on Twitter or at InfoNile Project on Facebook. Um, you share your comments or share your questions and tag our panelists and we can keep the discussion going online on how media can really shed the light on the intersections between wildlife conservation and preventing diseases. Um, we will send you all a copy of the recording as well in case you'd, come, you'd gone out and come back in uh, due to internet challenges or if you'd like to share it with anyone who wasn't able to make it for the session. But just want to thank all of the panelists once again, and thank you, Joffrey. Thank you to everyone who came on to participate um, so actively in this discussion. We really appreciate it. And I'd like to welcome Fred back to officially close this discussion. Yeah. Thank you so much, Anika. Thank you so much, uh, Geoffrey. I want to thank uh, our speakers, uh, Dr. Gladys Karema. Thank you so much. I remember when I requested you to come and uh, speak to us, you were easy to get. Thank you so much. Uh, no wonder you're doing great work. 
Uh, Jimmy Mahewa is gone, but he's been doing some great work in Uganda. Thank you so much, Jimmy. Thank you so much, Gerard Tenua. Thank you so much, Caroline Chebet. Uh, Anthony Ochenk. Um, uh, we'll be talking more about using uh, 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 photos to tell solution journal journalism or uh, stories, you know. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank several other individuals that were in this. We are, we are about 80 uh, people on, in this, on this webinar. And uh, um, we had um, um, uh, our brother from Kenya, uh, Daniel uh, Agan from Mesha. Most of you guys from Kenya, you know him. Um, we've been with him. Uh, we had also uh, Kayesu Providence from uh, National Geographic uh, Society. For, uh, she's a National Geographic uh, Explorer. Thank you so much for attending. We'll meet some other time when we organize uh, kind of this uh, uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much.